I'm back. Didn't think you'd seen the last of me, did you? So, uh, the fifth sorceress. It's, um, it's pain. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Some of you know about the fifth sorceress. It is infamous among fantasy fans for just being a gigantic flop and for deserving to be a gigantic flop because it's absolutely terrible. Like, even if you haven't read it, you've probably heard a little bit about it before. Like, it came out when fantasy was just starting to get big and starting to be less of a niche genre. Like, in the early 2000s, when uh, after we had gotten stuff like uh, A Song of Ice and Fire and Wheel of Time, which were pretty big and semi-mainstream, and it came out around that time, it was marketed really heavily, and it just, it flopped. And it has largely faded into obscurity by now. Not completely, but largely, because we just have so much other fantasy to discuss, which is much better, and we'd rather talk about that, which, quite frankly, yeah, I would rather talk about most of that most of the time. Like, even people who are fans of, like, classic-style fantasy, you, you know, because classic fantasy like Lord of the Rings and Sword of Shannara and stuff is a bit different than modern stuff like, say, Mistborn or the Powder Mage trilogy. Uh, but, you know, classic-type fantasy does still have its audience, and that sort of thing does still come out sometimes, and even fans of that don't like The Fifth Sorceress. Like, there's no audience for it, as far as I can tell. Now, I did do a review of this book when I first read it about five years ago, and you can watch it if you want. It's not a good video, in my opinion. You know, it's very old. But, you know, I did need to go into this in more detail. Like, I've been saying for quite a while that I wanted to just do a really, really long review of it for quite a while, and, you know, you can see all those tabs and everything, so obviously I have plenty to talk about. And uh, then I also wanted to talk about the sequels, because no one has ever spoken about those things before, because I don't think anyone's ever read them before. I think after the first book, everyone said, yeah, I'm good. And, uh, well, they're, they're not good. Like, I, I'll admit, I was curious about what would happen, but they're, they're just not good. Daniel Green, another YouTuber, uh, did do a review of this first book a while ago, and he said it was the worst book that he had ever re read, if you want his perspective. I personally would say that it's one of the worst I've ever read, but not quite the worst. And another reason I wanted to cover this book is that I do cover a lot of young adult stuff in this format, which, I mean, I just like doing it because it's, it's fun, you know, a lot of young adult stuff is bad in, like, a crazy way, which is fun to poke fun at. And sometimes people accuse me of just going after stuff that I'm not the target audience for, like, going, yeah, no, no shit, you don't enjoy this, you're not supposed to, and I'm like, well, number one, I can still point out its flaws and the way it fails to tell the story that it's attempting to tell. Like, even if I'm not in the target audience and I'm not going to enjoy it all that much, even if it does what it's trying to do well, I can still point out that it fails at what it's trying to do. And number two, there are plenty of terrible books out there that are written for me and people like me. Like, there's plenty of trend-chasing, incompetent, unedited piles of crap out there that are made for me the same way that there's tons of crap out there that is not made for me. So I I don't want to say like I'm doing this to get people off my back because I don't care that much, but this should uh, show people that yeah, I do get outside that realm and I'm perfectly happy to make fun of other genres as well. And it's easy to always want to one-up myself, especially with these, you know, big long reviews. Because it, it's just easy to want to make the next one bigger and m call it the worst book ever. And then, like, after that, you're looking for the next worst book ever, which is even worse and even stupider. And if you do that too much, you can wind up entering a spiral where you're, you're just always looking for more hyperbole, always trying to make it longer just for the sake of making it longer, always trying to go into uh, detail about even smaller problems which you wouldn't have uh, picked up on before and you wouldn't have talked about before. You're basically entering an arms race with yourself at that point, so like, you know, you, you need to know when to pull back. And, like I said just a few minutes ago, The Fifth Sorceress is not the worst book I've ever read. It is close, but it is the worst epic fantasy I've ever read by far. And I think that's also an important thing to talk about, is not just like, the worst book you've ever read or the worst movie you've ever watched or something like that because you know seeing that can help you 
figure out what not to do and know what to do going forward, but it's also important to look at like the worst of specific genres so that you can know what works and doesn't work within those specific genres. Before this series, the worst epic fantasy I had ever read was The Sword of Truth, or as I like to call it, The Adventures of Ayn Rand Althor. And The Sword of Truth was really bad because it's, you know, derivative, it's got two-dimensional characters, the story is dull, it's full of the author's thinly veiled sexual fetishes, libertarianism is in there, like, etc. You know, there's just a lot of stuff in there which is really bad and awful and it's just not a fun read. But, as bad as Sword of Truth is, Terry Goodkind understood the basics of the epic fantasy genre that he was trying to write in, at least. Like, he understood that you need villains, and you need heroes with motivations, and the story can't just be a series of fights to make the main character look cool. Like, I hate that I have to sound like I'm praising Sword of Truth a little bit here, but it is at least competent on some baseline level. And from what I've heard here, Robert Newcomb, the author of The Fifth Sorceress, had never read epic fantasy before. He just decided he could write one one day, and I, I guess he wasn't wrong. I mean, he did type this thing out, and he did take it to a publisher, and they did publish it, and it did sell at least a little bit, uh, so he wasn't wrong. It, it just isn't a good fantasy that he wrote. What's this actually about, though? Well, the story follows Tristan. He is the prince of a kingdom called Eutrasia, and it follows him on his quest to save the world from a coven of evil sorceresses who have killed his family. And, well, honestly, saying evil sorceresses is redundant because in this series, women who use magic are just inherently evil, but we will, we'll get to that later, don't worry. So, story-wise, it is pretty simple. It really is. And simple is hard to fuck up. Newcomb still managed, though. All of the characters here are basically just Disney animatronics that give monologues when certain events are triggered. Like, none of them have any depth beyond what the immediate plot demands of them. Except for Tristan, who gets told what to do a lot, and acts really childish. And that that's mostly what there is to him. Like, the, the lack of depth for characters can sometimes work if the characters are still fun or likable, but I mean, you know I wouldn't be complaining about this this way if they were. Like, obviously, they're, they're not. Most of them are douchebags. I've talked about the world building in this series in the past and how little sense it makes, but what's worse is just how little world building there is. You know, we see two kingdoms, not just in the first book, but in the entire trilogy. Like, that's all we saw. That's all we see. And there's very little that separates them at all other than one is ruled by good guys, and one is ruled by villains. And, like, that that's it. Like, they have the same language, the same religion, or lack thereof, uh, the same basic geography, similar climates, similar flora and fauna. Like, there's zero creativity here. Just picture medieval European-inspired fantasy world, and you will get an idea of what Eutrasia and Partholon look like. Like, you, you know what this world is like. It... It feels like if someone took Middle Earth and then photocopied it a hundred times and then ran out of ink halfway through. Like, it's the exact same thing, but it's done so poorly that, that there's just nothing to it. Frankly, the only thing about this series at all that is even kind of unique in the genre is that there's a lot of hyper, hyper violence in here, like, to, to a ludicrous degree, and some of the crazier plot points did catch me off guard, but I mean, I mean, they're not good, but at least they did stand out in a few ways. So, anyways, yeah, like that's enough of an intro. Let's get started. Spoilers, obviously. And like I said, there's some fucked up shit in here, so just be aware of that going forward. We open on a line from the prophecy because, of course, there's a prophecy. And a great war shall come to pass in which many shall die before the easing of its flames. The dark side of the conflict, those of the pentacle, shall come to defeat before finding their fifth, and only after the discovery of the stone and the tome by their enemies, the banishment of those of the p pentacle shall occur upon the sea from which few have returned." Okay, all that does is explain the plot in fancy words. Like, it's, it's not even vague or anything. Like, a big war will end, the sorceresses will 
later come back after someone discovers the tome and the stone, and we don't know exactly what those are referring to, but it becomes really obvious really early on. Frankly, we didn't need that at the beginning of the book. Like, we could figure out all of this on our own pretty quickly. Like, just cut it and we'll lose nothing. And then I also need to mention that the prophecy, that little bit we get, is apparently on page 2037 of the prophecy, and page 2037 is still chapter one. So, like, how long is this thing? So this is the prologue, which follows Wig, and Wig is a powerful wizard who has custody of the leaders of the sorceresses after the Sorceress War, which was this massive conflict which devastated the land and nearly killed everyone in Eutrasia, but eventually the good guys were victorious. And after the defeat, uh, the leaders of the sorceresses were taken prisoner, they're put on a ship, and they're sailed out onto the ocean. That's where they all are now. And it's specifically mentioned that the ship is, like, falling apart because it was damaged in the fighting, and they didn't stop to repair. Which is very stupid and a good way to kill everyone on board. Like, even if you're in a hurry, like, just spending a day putting some plywood and stuff in places to keep the ship together would be better than just going out when it has holes and shit in it. Like, what the shit, dude? Wig and the captain have a brief conversation where the captain mentions they've sailed 15 days east into the Sea of Whispers, which is the farthest they can go because no one has ever gone further than 15 days out and returned to tell the tale. Now, 15 days of sailing is not a unit of measurement. Like, the, the distance you go in 15 days would be dependent on things like the type of ship you're in, or the wind, or the currents, or if there's a storm, etc. So, like, you'd be going a lot faster or slower depending on all those things, but whatever, that is a small issue. We also learn that the sorceresses are being fed, but, like, just barely enough to keep them alive, because if they're well-fed, they'll get their powers back and they'll be able to escape using them, which... I suppose that does make some sense, like, you know, make them weak and they can't use their powers anymore, but even after reading all three books, I don't know how the magic here works. Like, I don't know where the energy they use comes from, because the magic just does what the plot needs it to. Like, sometimes it pretends to be a hard magic system, and there's, like, actual rules that the characters need to work around, and sometimes it's just soft and we know nothing about it and it just kind of does whatever. And I have no idea what it can do, what sort of limits there are, I don't know how it works, I don't know what sort of costs there are, if any. Like, even after all three books, like, there's the, the magic is there, and it affects things, but it doesn't affect them in any sort of consistent way. But like I said, keeping people half-starved to restrict their powers, like, okay, that makes sense, that's not the issue. Uh, so Wig and the sailors bring out the sorceresses, they put them on a lifeboat with some provisions to last them a couple of days, and then they just send them off into the ocean. And Wig also makes some currents with magic to push them out further uh, east so that they cannot possibly follow them. Like, he just makes little waves and little currents and shoves them off. And the sorceresses, while they're out there by themselves, they make a small evil speech about how they'll return one day and how one of them stayed behind. So the fifth sorceress is still back in Eutrasia. And they, they'll just, they'll be back one day. Now, you may be wondering, why didn't Wig and the others just kill the sorceresses? You know, they're evil, they're a threat, the big war just ended, this seems like a good way to make sure that the threat never comes back. And the reason is that the wizards are good guys, and part of using their good magic is that they cannot kill people unless there's a direct threat to their life or without prior warning. Because when Wig sends them off, he straight up says, if you come back, we will kill you, on pain of death. Like, so apparently it's also can be used to enforce the law, I guess. And that makes some sense on the surface, but you think about it for even half a second, it just falls apart. Like I said, Wig says that if the sorceresses return, they will be killed, so clearly they can execute people for breaking rules or laws as long as they warn them about it beforehand. Like... They specifically mention all of the crimes that the sorceresses have committed, too, including stuff like murder, torture, inciting war, and rape. And I'm pretty sure the sorceresses would have known that the penalty for most of those would be death if they were caught, so I feel like the wizards should be able to kill them in that case. And 
the reason that they had to send them off into the ocean, rather than just keeping them imprisoned in Eutrasia, so where the wizards could keep an eye on them, <laughs> is that the only way to suppress their powers would be to keep them barely fed, and then they would either die of starvation, or they would uh, get sick and die of that. And that apparently also counts as murder by the rules that the wizards are following. But if that counts as murder, then so should sending them off into the ocean with very little food and no way back. Like, w Wig specifically says, well, well, they had to have at least kind of a, a chance to survive, otherwise it doesn't count, and... Oh my god, that's just... None of this adds up, man. And I get that this is the very beginning. You know, sometimes you ask uh, questions about the setup of a story uh, because it just doesn't make that much sense. <clears throat> and you're like, well, why would the characters do this? Or why would they do that? And sometimes you just have to say, like, well, because if they did it a different way, then there would be no story. You know, like, sometimes people do dumb things and that leads to bigger conflict. However, you can set it up better than this, man. Like, th this is part of a trend of all of the problems only occurring because the good guys are stupid. Here's a better idea for how to start this story off. Uh, have it be, like, the end of the war, you know, the sorceresses have been defeated, their armies are shattered, and they just sail off into the ocean to escape, and everyone assumes that they died. Like, you can even have the same bit with Wig on the ship, and they're, like, trying to chase after them, and then they get 15 days out, and they realize, like, okay, you know what, if they're gonna keep going past this point, then they're already dead. We just, we have to turn back or we'll be dead too. Like, that would be a better beginning, at least. Now, in Wheel of Time, the Aes Sedai have to follow kind of a similar oath to the wizards here. Like, they cannot use magic as a weapon except in self-defense or against servants of the Dark One, who is basically just an evil god who is behind all bad things that happen uh, in that world. And so there's enough exceptions here that they can still function. You know, like, if someone comes at them, they can kill them. Uh, and if they come across, like, evil creatures or evil servants or something, and killing them is the best way to do it, then they can just do it, no questions asked. And so they can function. The wizards in the Fifth Sorceress cannot. And uh, this is not the last time I'm going to have to compare it to Wheel of Time. There's a weird number of ways in which it kind of tries to ape that series, but does a bad job of it. And of course, the prose here is just... awful. He turned his attention to the woman at the end of the line to the right. Tall and still shapely, despite the effects of near starvation, she was exquisitely beautiful. No one looks sexy and beautiful all the time. Like, that's just not a thing that happens. Like, it, it, I know this is something that Hollywood does a lot. Like, people will live in the woods, or it'll be after the apocalypse, but they still have, you know, perfect hair and teeth and makeup and stuff. And that's kind of cringy in visual form. But it's even worse when it's written. And it's done often with the, with, with the women in this series. Like, they're always pretty, even after they're suffering and even after they're being tortured and everything. Like, they're always pretty. They're never allowed to look anything other than pretty. It's it's just dumb, and it makes their suffering seem like it's really not that bad. The prologue lasts until page 32, by the way, and, well, like, I didn't really leave anything out there. Like, everything I described to you is what happens. It just takes more than 30 pages to happen, and that's probably the biggest single issue with this series. Like, everything takes about five times longer to happen than it should, because the animatronics trying to pretend that their characters have to monologue about things before and after the things happen. Like, for example, Wig spends about six pages in the prologue explaining the rules for why he couldn't kill the sorceresses, and that was after he already sent them off. Like, I, I get that it's a convoluted setup, but like I said, you could probably have set that up better, and even if you didn't, you didn't need to spend that long explaining it. Like, you could have condensed that substantially. Now, this might be acceptable. Like, all of these characters monologuing about stuff might be acceptable if the monologues were shorter or if there were just fewer of them. But every big event in this series, and even a bunch of the smaller ones, are prefaced with a whole bunch of explaining and then followed by a whole bunch more explaining. Like, what just ha what's about to happen? The thing happens. What just happened? Like, that. that's this whole book. It feels like Robert Newcomb heard that you're supposed to build up to big events by making the readers care about the characters, which is true. Yeah, you can't just have, like, big shocking events or action scenes or something uh, without us giving a shit about the people involved. 
but rather than giving them dialogue so that they can actually develop personality or having them do things so that they develop personality, they just jabber on and on about the plot, and he thinks, yes, this will this will make the the uh, readers love them, and this will build up to the big events so that when they happen, it'll be cool and everyone will love it. After the prologue, we cut forward 327 years, and we meet the protagonist of the story, Tristan. And through a whole lot of him just thinking and the narrative... I mean, let's be honest, the, narrative, the narrator is basically monologuing to the audience at this point. Uh, we learn that he is about to inherit the throne of Eutrasia, and he's conflicted about it because he doesn't really want to be king. Over the course of pages and pages of exposition, uh, we learn that the kings of Eutrasia always abdicate when their sons turn 30 years old. And plus there's a bunch of other intricacies in the inheritance law as well, which we don't need to get into, but it's there and it goes on for quite a bit. And Tristan is about to turn 30 years old. Now, I want you to keep that in mind throughout all of this. He's not 16 years old. Like some of the actions he takes part in uh, later on might make some sense coming from someone that was like 16, 17 years old, but he's a grown ass man. Please keep that in mind as we go forward. But yes, this whole beginning part basically boils down to he doesn't want to be king because being king means he has responsibilities. Wah. He wasn't looking forward to his 30th birthday, and he didn't want to be king. He also did not wish to be counseled by wizards for the remainder of his life. No matter how he tried, he just couldn't get the truth of his feelings out of his head, nor could he forget the oath that the old ones would make him take at the ceremony when he succeeded to the throne. He would then be forced to follow in footsteps of his father until his firstborn son turned 30 years old. He sighed. He didn't have any sons yet. He didn't even have a wife. Like, you see this so often in stories and just like, dude, why don't you just find some noble in your kingdom and have him be your prime minister? Like, just go up to him and say, hey, bro, you can have all the real power and I'm just going to drink and party while I get to be your puppet. Like, you want to be a corrupt leader of a country, right? Like, just do that. Like... You could find someone to do that with. Like, just do that. Like, I'd like to see that just once, you know? And this might be fine from a teenager, again, but he he's 30. Like, dude's older than me. This is ridiculous. So while he's brooding, he goes to his happy place, which is the woods, and he just practices some knife throwing. And that's fine, but during this sequence, we learn that he apparently invented throwing knives. Like, yeah, in this world... No one had ever stopped and thought to themselves, like, I need to stab that guy, but he's way over there. Why don't I just do, do that? Like, that's, that's stupid. Someone would have thought of it beforehand. Especially because throwing knives isn't really that difficult. Like, getting good at it takes a lot of practice and hard work, yes, and Tristan is really good at it, so it, it spends time showing how he practices and everything. Like, I believe he's good at it, yes. But the thing is, you can learn in, like, ten minutes how to reliably throw it and get it to hit a target the size of like a person uh from like 10 or 20 feet away like it's not that hard i've done it before someone would have thought of this is what i'm getting at and while tristan is brooding something pushes him off a cliff and he nearly falls to his death but he manages to grab onto a branch that's just hanging off and he climbs his way back up and you may be wondering well who would try to kill the prince like this and it turns out it was his horse like, his horse was annoyed with him for some reason and just, like, shoved him off and nearly spared us the pain of having to read the rest of this story. That's a very thrilling way to handle your first action scene, by the way. Like, just, whoa, oh no, I'm about to die, climb up. Oh, hey, it was my horse. My horse threw me. And uh, his horse is named Pilgrim as well, which is not a problem, I guess. Like, it's a fine enough name. I just, every time the book mentioned it, it made me think of John Wayne. Pilgrim also plays fetch with Tristan, which, when I first read this, I thought that was especially stupid, because I was like, okay, horses don't play fetch, that's not a thing they do. Uh, it turns out that they can play fetch, it's just really uncommon, uh, so I'm not sure why they would put it in there. It, it's an odd scene, like, I don't know if Robert Newcomb just knows anything about horses at all, or if he just thought that they're big dogs, but they're not. So... Tristan sits in the woods for a while after his near-death experience and thinks even more about how the succession is going to work. And he thinks about, okay, his dad is going to abdicate, and then he's going to get enchantments put on him to make him stop aging, and then he will join the Directorate of Wizards, who is 
uh, like the group of wizards who are, you know, in charge of all the magic in Eutrasia, and they advise the king and everything. And they handle all the magic stuff, and just, yeah, it, his, his uh, father, King Nicholas, will be part of that. And it's actually implied that the Directorate of Wizards are the real power behind the throne, but it's never outright stated. And I admit that, that I kind of like that. You know, it's, it's subtlety that we don't see elsewhere. Because, I mean, think about it. Like, all the kings have to abdicate when their son turns 30 years old, but you gotta think, like, there would be some dudes who wouldn't want to give up their power until they're dead. How do you enforce that they're doing that? Well, how about these immortal wizards who are advising him and have control over all the magic in the kingdom, essentially? Like, they are basically the power behind the throne, and the fact that they never come right out and say it is an impressive level of restraint coming from Robert Newcomb. And of course, Tristan has to spend a little bit of time thinking about how much of a chad he is. As Tristan continued to watch the sky, his mind turned from affairs of state to affairs of the heart. Even though he didn't have a wife, he should soon say queen, he reminded himself, there had nonetheless been many women in his life. He sighed, far too many, according to his parents. Even his twin sister, Shailaha, his most staunch defender of what some would call his recent disregard for his royal duties and responsibilities, had begun to criticize him about his romantic dalliances. But the prince had always been kind to those women who hoped to capture his heart. Because of his good looks and royal position, the realm was positively overflowing with women who were more than willing to try. Sometimes, during his public appearances at court, he couldn't decide which flapped faster their batting eyelashes, or the unfolded fans that each of them always seem to obligate to flutter while trying to cool the quick blush of their cheeks. Wow, it's a long sentence. Many, to the increasingly obvious chagrin of both chagrin of both his family and the directorate, had ended up in his bed, but he had never fallen in love. So it's important that we know he's not only a chad, but he's a nice guy. And then right after this, he thinks about how awesome he is as a sword fighter, which is, yeah, that's clearly better than just showing us how good he is as, as a sword fighter by having him get into a fight or something early on, you know, that would, that would be much worse. I can't imagine why anyone would want to do that. Uh, but please, please tell us more about how cool and hot the main character is. Please. People who have the capability to learn magic in this world are referred to as having endowed blood, and men who have endowed blood are referred to as endowed males. Yes, Tristan is a very well-endowed male, I'm sure. That would explain why he's such a chad, I guess. It's not just size. You gotta, you gotta know what you're doing, man. And his blood is, like, super well-endowed. It's, like, super pure, which means something. It just, it just means he's really powerful. He has the potential to be a super amazing, powerful wizard, I think. But he uh, has not done any training yet, even though he's an adult. And we never see much difference between the power levels of different magic users, though. Like, Wig and a couple others are, like, the top, top tier of this world, uh, but we don't really know what Tristan can do that they can't. Like, sometimes characters will basically just say, yeah, I can't do that, I'm not powerful enough, and then they'll go on to do other really impressive feats. Like, just Wig and uh, some others are really powerful, and some other wizards are less powerful just because... I don't know exactly why. And I want to remind you all that we are still in the first chapter. So Tristan sees some butterflies that glow with magic, uh, which he's heard about but never seen in person before, called the Flyers of the Fields, which are said to uh, go around this area. And he follows them to a cave wall, which collapses, and then he falls in and is unconscious. And that's the end of chapter one on page 58. Look, all the chapters here are way too long. Like... They mess with the pacing and make the story feel even slower than it really is. Like, you can have chapters that are too short and then the, it just feels choppy and it messes with the flow, but when chapters just go on and on and on, like, it's just obnoxious to go through. Like, they should have a few scenes with important stuff, but rather than that, we have a few scenes with important stuff, and then they have monologues about one thing, and then maybe something will happen, and then another monologue about that thing, and then another monologue about something totally different, and so on. And some of these chapters just go on for like 50 or 60 pages like that. It's really obnoxious and makes it difficult to find a good place to stop. When you're writing something long, whether it's like a book, or a YouTube video, or a movie, pacing is really, really important the longer it is. Like, the longer it becomes, the more important pacing is. 
Like you need to properly space all of the events and the important information just right to make it feel like it's moving, but not too fast. Like if you have it too much all at once, then nothing really has time to sink in. And especially if there's exposition involved, it can feel like it's going too fast and you can confuse the audience. But if it's going too slow, then it just becomes tedious and annoying to get through. Uh, for example, I'm doing this in two parts because the end of the first book is a pretty good stopping point before I get to the rest of the series. Like, it gives your brain a chance to reset and make sure I don't ramble on about anything that's unimportant. Like, imagine if part one of this video ended mid-sentence and then it just continued after the next one. Like, even if it's the same content and it's the same length, it would be a bad stopping point and it would mess with the pacing and it would leave everyone unsatisfied. If people complain about something being too long, it's probably due to poor pacing. Like, if something is really long and it has good pacing, you don't notice the length usually. And I admit, this is a difficult balancing act to do, but Robert Newcomb clearly wasn't skilled enough to do it and he fails. So, when we get to chapter 2, it starts with Wig, who is still alive because he was enchanted to never age, and he'll still die if he's wounded, like if you stab him or something, he'll still bleed to death, but he just never ages. And uh, so Wig and Tristan's twin sister, Shilaha, are riding horses through the woods and they're looking for him. And this line, th th just this line exists. She frowned. As the date of her father's abdication ceremony drew near, Tristan somehow seemed to get into more and more trouble, and she was determined to keep today's incident from their parents. This man is 30. He's 30 years old. Shilaha is also pregnant, which doesn't really affect anything in the series. It just, I mean, it makes her seem more vulnerable, I guess, but it really doesn't lead to anything at any point. Uh, so they ride for like 10 pages, just thinking again about Tristan and how cool he is and how he's getting in trouble and blah, blah, blah. And they get attacked by a creature, which Wig later calls a Bloodstalker. And Bloodstalkers look kind of like humans, they're just bulky and misshapen. And we actually get a detailed description of this thing's genitals and how they hang down, which is cool, really glad that's there. And uh, Wig telekinetically grabs the axe that it was holding and hits it in the skull with it and kills it. And Shilaha faints upon seeing this, you know, how like, how women be like, you know, they just, they can't handle violence. They, they just be fainting. Women be fainting. This line is kind of funny out of context, though. Suck on this from time to time, little one, he said compassionately. Through another really long monologue from Wig, because if I'm being honest, he does most of the monologues in this book, uh, we learn that Bloodstalkers were wizards that got mutated by the sorceresses, and they go to, off to hunt other wizards. And touching their blood will kill you. Like, their blood is yellow, and it, it, even just touching it with your bare skin will kill you very quickly. And Wig also thinks about how He's heard some uh, wizards in the countryside have been going missing, and he thought that Bloodstalkers were all wiped out at the end of the Sorceress War, so he thinks, wait, this thing, or maybe others like it, might be hunting wizards down in the countryside. That's not good. And then we go back to Tristan. Tristan is in the cave where he fell, and he's perfectly fine because falling unconscious is just a shitty writer's best tool for cliffhangers. You know, just like very convenient unconsciousness used as a plot device. That's a common tactic of crappy writers. And he wanders around for a little bit, he sees a pool of just red water, and it entices him, and he just, it calls to him, and he decides to bathe in it because plot. Like, you know, plot needs to happen. And he also realizes that the flyers of the fields are just regular butterflies, but they drink from this magic red water, and that's what makes them glow. And then he leaves, and he finds Wig and his sister, and Wig can instantly tell that he found the caves of the Paragon, and that he, uh, bathed in the water, and Wig is horrified by this. Like, that, that's the actual word that the book uses, by the way. He's horrified for some reason. Like, it apparently activates Tristan's powers, but his powers didn't need activation at all, his blood was already really pure, and he doesn't really do anything with those powers at any point. Like, th th this never comes back up. I don't know why they just start, decided to start the book this way. Like, he, he bathes in the water, and like that's how he finds out about this cave, and the cave and the waters there are kind of important, but the fact that Tristan bathes there is not. So during yet another monologue, Wig explains that they only won the Sorceress War because they found this cave, 
and the cave had the water in it, it had a tome, like a really big book full of a bunch of magic knowledge, and there was like a stone on a necklace which they decide to call the Paragon. And the King of Eutrasia wears the Paragon uh, around his neck, and getting it is part of the coronation ceremony. And like, it just gives wizards really powerful magic, I guess. Like, it, it makes magic super strong. And water from the cave is used in the ceremony to give it to a new master, and the water is also magic and is used for plot devices. I need to let you know that we just reached the 100 page mark. Like, th this is all that has happened in 100 pages. Like, th this book is long. It's like 900 pages, this copy, but the length is very deceptive. Like, almost nothing happens throughout. Like, I'm not leaving things out here. Everything just takes so long, and it's like 90% monologues, so it just, it simultaneously feels like it's way too long, and also you look back and you realize, like, w what even happened? It's really obnoxious. So, Tristan, despite being tutored by wizards for his 30 years of life, uh, apparently hasn't learned anything about magic before, so Wig monologues about it for pages and pages and pages. Just something happened! <laughs> and he explains that magic falls into two categories. There's the vigors, which is good magic, and the vagaries, which are evil magic. And the vagaries are what made the sorceresses evil back back in the day. And after the war, uh, he and the other wizards decided that women are forbidden from using magic because, and I'm not making this up, women are just naturally predisposed to be evil when given power. And they're just naturally predisposed to start practicing with the vagaries. Jesus, there is a lot to unpack there, and frankly, I'm I'm ignoring it because, like, if you don't see the problem there, then no explaining will make you understand. So I'm just I'm just moving on, like, and I'm not reading into this. Like I said, it just it just straight up says that in the book. And uh, even after all of that monologuing and all the other stuff we learn later, I have no idea how magic is supposed to work, like how it's powered, uh, what sort of limits it has, what it can do. Etc. That's just, it, that, that's just, I, I don't know anything about it. It's just magic comes along and does what the plot needs it to. So, Wig can also apparently summon a physical manifestation of the Vigors, and it's like a this glowing golden orb, and he just summons it and shows it to Tristan, and Tristan's like, oh, that's cool. And then he also summons the Vagaries, which is like this glowing black orb. Cool. And there's some talk about how both sides are very important and the whole world operates with, like, opposing forces. Each thing in nature has its opposite, the wizard said calmly as he stood before the orbs. Male and female, light and dark, and so it goes throughout the entire scheme of the world as we know it. The two sides of the craft are no different, but unlike the other examples I just mentioned, the vigors and the vagaries cannot join. Now, the fact that they can't be mixed is kind of odd to me. Uh, like... There are a lot of real-world philosophies which bring up this whole idea of dual forces. Uh, like, Taoism is a very good example. Like, that's where yin and yang comes from. Uh, the ancient Egyptians also had, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but they had this idea of order and chaos, which were constantly working against each other in, uh, in the world. And the thing is, yin and yang, and a lot of others like it, they work together and against each other simultaneously. Like, the whole point of it is that while they are different, neither of them can exist alone. Like, it's not as simple as good and evil. Now, again, Wheel of Time uh, did something similar to this with two halves of magic and, well, with gender relations in general. Like, men could use one type of magic, women could use another. And both sides needed the other to function properly. And when one side was gone for millennia, by the time the story begins, like, the world was worse off for it. And that is extrapolated to talk about men and women in general, not just magically. And there's no commentary like that here. There's just, the vigors are good and the vagaries are evil. If they mix, the world will end? Probably. Wig isn't totally sure about that. He just thinks that if they mix, the world will end. And he drones on and on about it for a while. Uh, and then he just decides Tristan isn't ready to hear everything else about the Paragon and magic. Which I'm pretty sure just means the author didn't know what to put there, but okay. So the next chapter, we are introduced to Natasha, and she was the fifth sorceress who was left behind when the others went across the ocean. She's been hanging out in Eutrasia for 
300 years and just waiting for her time to make trouble, which is coming up soon. Nowadays, she's a noblewoman, and she's biding her time to do evil stuff, and she travels to Eutrasia's capital, which is called Tamerland, for the coronation ceremony, and she just sits there and thinks about how evil she is. There had been many younger and more vital men in her bed to amuse her since her wedding day. It always made her laugh to imagine the looks that would have come upon their faces had she told any of them how old she truly was. But that was unimportant. There would always be more, especially since her husband's existence would soon be coming to an end. You may as well just put up a flashing neon sign that says, I am evil, mwahaha. And it, apparently just being horny is evil if you're a woman. Like, that's what it seems to be saying. And that, that's a common theme throughout this book. It's not just that one bit. It's like every woman who ever shows any sort of sexual desire, whether for men or for other women, winds up being evil, except for one who shows up not in this book, but in the next one. However, her desire is apparently okay because, number one, it's for the main character, and number two, it's very downplayed. Like, she only has the hots for this one person who she's in a committed relationship with. But, you know, going around and having sex with a bunch of multiple partners, like, that's, that's just evil if you're a woman. Remember, Tristan can still be a fuckboy and also be the chosen one. So it's not like they're saying that sex is bad in general. It's just like, women being horny is evil. Natasha meets Tristan, and they talk about how awesome he is, and this goes nowhere, but he does think about how she is, quote, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, and he has a sword fight with his sister's husband, who is Frederick, and is apparently also his best friend, but the only evidence we get that he's his best friend is that Tristan sees him and thinks, he's my best friend, and then they don't really do anything together at all, and uh, they fight for a bit. And Frederick does the trick where he looks over his shoulder and goes, Look behind you! And then Tristan looks over and Frederick beats him like that. Which is just, uh, that that's just embarrassing, Tristan. Like, what is, what is wrong with you? Like, this would be a better way to show that Tristan is apparently a great swordsman, you know? Show him practice a little. That would, that'd be preferable, at least. It is also funny to me when names like Tristan and Frederick are mixed with names like Wig and Shilaha. Like, it's not uncommon in fantasy, but it, it does make me chuckle when it happens. So we cut to Wig meeting with the Directorate of Wizards and the King, who is named Nicholas, and he brings up the Bloodstalker and shows them the axe, and even straight up tells them, like, hey, don't touch the dried blood on the axe because it'll kill you. And he mentions the disappearances of the other wizards and just, just say, hey, uh, evil people might be planning something. So he and the other wizards suggest maybe canceling the coronation ceremony because it would be a target for attack, and the king refuses to do so because it would make him look weak. Now, keep in mind, during this ceremony, they take the paragon off of the king's neck, and when they do that, it loses its power. Like, it turns from red to being clear. And uh, the way they restore its power is by dipping it in some water from the cave, and then the water turns clear, and the stone turns red again, that restores its power, they put it around the neck of the next king, and then they all have their powers again. Like, during that interlude, the wizards are powerless, and uh, vulnerable. And so, obviously, yeah, this, this could be a security issue, but the king refuses to cancel it. So they suggest, okay, what if we do the real ceremony in the giant underground maze below the palace where it's safe, and then we could do a fake ceremony for the public? And the king still says no to this. Why does he say no to it? Because he's stupid. And, I mean, again, I mentioned before, the directorate is the real power behind the throne, uh, but they can't oppose him publicly or straightforwardly, so it, it seems like there is more give and take here than you would normally expect to see in a fantasy story, at least one that isn't focused on politics. So but again, that's a that's a neat little detail. But uh, the thing is, if they did the ceremony uh, below ground privately and then did the fake one uh, for the crowds, then the coming disaster would be avoided. Like the whole story would end at the first act and a whole bunch of people would have survived. Like, look, the heroes can have flaws which cause problems, especially problems for themselves, but it's really hard to care about them when they're this openly incompetent. So they all bring Tristan into the meeting with, like, the king and the queen and the other wizards, and they have a talk. And it's not that interesting. They basically just tell him, hey, Tristan, you have responsibilities, you need to be king, blah, blah, blah. And he finally agrees, okay, fine, I'm going to be king, and he, like, accepts the responsibility. It's a 
kind of a nice moment, I guess. Like, I, I don't like Tristan at all, but he does have some character to him. Like, he's not a total blank slate, which he very easily could have been. He has one or two small things about him that aren't annoying, and a whole bunch of things about him that are annoying, but honestly, I would rather him be annoying or just bad in general than have him be boring and have no personality. Like, it, it could be worse, is what I'm saying. And then finally, we cut to the sorceresses who are across the ocean in the land of Parthalon, and they're obviously still alive. And one of them, who is named Suck You, uh, so, so Suck You is whipping a slave because he couldn't get an erection when she tried to play with him against his will, let's say. And remember, women being sexual is bad, and we need to remind the audience that the villains are pure evil. So every chance we get, we have to show them torturing people or killing people, or just having some sort of weird BDSM sex. Now, I'm fine with this bit being there, like, cuts away to show us the villains doing their thing for a little while, like, that's fine, but it should have been earlier. Like, ideally, it would have been right after Tristan landed in the cave. Like, that chapter ends, and we're like, oh no, what's happening with him? And then it cuts to this one, and so it avoids bringing the pacing to a complete halt right as things were starting to happen. Like, because, you know, that whole first bit, where Tristan finally accepts that he's gonna be king, like, it felt like the story was finally beginning to move forward, and then it halts, and we go somewhere else, and we have to learn all this exposition, and we have to meet these new characters and everything, and it just, it just grinds everything to a halt, so mixing it together would have been better even if you changed nothing else. So we learned that the sorceresses came over from Eutrasia, and they landed here, they crossed the ocean, which no one had ever done before, and when they got to Parthalon, there was no government or army, and apparently no one over there had magic, so they just conquered everything relatively easily, which, <clears throat> that's kind of dumb, like you would expect there to be some sort of governing structure, even if it's just on a village level, and I'm not sure why there's no magic here either, I guess Parthalonians aren't the master race, I don't know. And so sorceresses refused to procreate with the men over there because the men are not well endowed, the way Kristen, Tristan is, and that means their children would be less powerful with magic, which raises the question of how people with pure blood arose to begin with, and it seems like Tristan and Shiloh should be just as well endowed as their parents rather than more powerful, but okay, sure. Uh, we learn that all of the troublemakers in Parthalon are put into a walled-off city, which they call the Ghetto of the Shunned, and plus they have stables full of slaves, both men and women, for the sorceresses to abuse because they are evil and we need to be reminded that they are evil. Uh, and also, being bisexual is a sign of evil here. Like, later on when a character is brainwashed to be evil, in order to show how evil she is, they just show off that she's bisexual now. Which, like, that that's horribly homophobic, just, just throwing that out there. And again, I'm not doing any sort of reading into this or anything, like, it just, it just straight up says all this. So suck you off also has a servant named Geldin, and Geldin is a dwarf, like not a fantasy dwarf creature that lives in Moria, but like a just a human with dwarfism, who is also hunchbacked, and she decided that she liked having him as a pet, so she enchanted him not to age. And I bring him up because he's a really minor character now, but he be inc becomes important later, and you need to know that he's there. So suck you off, also meets with the other sorceresses to talk about how evil they are and how their evil plans are evilly coming to fruition because Natasha is preparing things in Eutrasia and they are preparing to go over there and do their evil things. And how do they talk to uh, Natasha over such long distances? Magic. Why is this never used again for the rest of the series? Because convenience, you know, characters being able to talk to each other easily over long distances would just, it would make things too easy. The leader of the coven is named Faley, and then there's Suck you and Natasha, and you can just forget about the other two. They are not important. Like, you don't even need to know their names or anything, just they... They're there, they exist, but you don't need to know anything about them. So while they were over in Parthalon, the sorceresses created a race of warriors to uh, serve them. And they are basically just humans with giant, like, leather bat wings, so they can fly about them, they can fly around places. Uh, and they go into detail about the breeding programs they used, and how men are not allowed to have sex with human women, and how all the females of the species are just put into these, I mean, essentially brothels, where they're just there for breeding, like, that. that's all they do. And they, they mention that coitus interruptus is not allowed, like, it, it literally says that. Google it if you don't know. I really don't know why they felt the need 
to bring that up at all, like, you know, you know, you could just say like, yeah, there's a big breeding program. They aren't allowed to have sex with human women. The females are only brood mares. Like we, we get the picture, you know, you don't need to specifically say like, Hey, pulling out is not allowed. Like th there's a point where your world building is too much. You know, like the only example of this, I can think that's this bad is wizards at Hogwarts used to shit on the floor. Like that, that's the only thing I've ever seen in fantasy that comes to this level. And what are these terrifying winged creatures called? Minions. So we meet the leader of the minions, who is named Kluge, and Kluge is in love with Sukyu, but he knows that she'll never love him back because he doesn't have magic, and Sukyu is infatuated with Tristan because he has magic, and also he's the main character, and Kluge decides he wants to kill Tristan. And we spend, no joke, 25 pages explaining who the good, good guys are. Like, the characters we spent the whole first part of the book learning about, like Tristan and Wig and Shyla, like, 25 pages explaining who they are and that they're going to attack at the coronation ceremony, which we already knew, and that just, we don't even get a lot more detail or anything, like, just saying, we'll attack then. Now, having a chapter or two introducing the villains is good. That, that's a good thing to have. Uh, having it be just giving a bunch of information we already know about and giving a bunch of exposition which we don't care about and doesn't factor into the story that much instead of giving these villains more character depth is bad. So we finally go back to Tristan and it's like the next morning after he's had sex with someone because he's the main character and while he's training with some guards a big winged creature with a woman's face comes in and attacks the soldiers while they're training and a short battle follows, which is... Eh, it's okay. Like, it, it's an okay fight, really. Uh, they make a big deal about Tristan trying to get into position to throw a knife into the beast's eye and hopefully kill it, but that winds up just annoying it. And then Wig shows up and crushes it in a magic cage. Like, you know, he just makes bars of energy surrounding it and then just it gets smaller and smaller until it crushes it, which is a cool way to kill it, but also Tristan just seems useless here and he's supposed to be the main character, so, like... It's no fun for him to be useless. The real problem here is that this alerts Wig and the others to the sorceresses planning an attack. Because they realize, okay, if all these creatures are coming out, then the sorceresses must be planning something. Or someone with magic must be planning something. And so they prepare a little bit. Like, the heroes would not have prepared at all for the attack if the sorceresses hadn't sent these monsters to attack them. And even Faye chastises the others for this later. But again, remember, the heroes if they had done the coronation ceremony privately a little earlier, they also wouldn't have run into the same trouble later. Like, both sides are dumbasses. They both foiled their own plans. They're, they're just, they're, they're all so stupid. Like, this whole story only exists because all of the characters involved are stupid. So back to the villains. Kluge and Suck Hugh, off, are having sex because they're evil. And uh, they're sailing across the Sea of Whispers, and right when they get to the middle point, which is like the point where no one has ever crossed before other than the sorceresses, these massive monsters called necrophagians appear in the water. They're like giant human heads that float under the water, made of rotting flesh, and they eat whoever comes nearby, and they also create these giant hands out of fog which grab hold of the ships so they can't sail away. And the sorceresses throw 40 dead slaves overboard, the necrophagians eat them, and then they can pass. Because apparently, uh, 300 years ago, uh, the sorceresses, when they first got here, made a deal with the necrophagians that any time they passed, they would give them 40 dead people to eat, rather than just having a couple of them to eat. I'll admit, I do like this. It's cool. Like, most fantasy stories do have, like, impossible ocean, or impassable oceans, or mountain ranges that characters can't cross. Usually, the reason they can't cross them is just because they're big. And here, it's like an ocean with mysterious, powerful, scary monsters that are stopping them. And we learn very little about the Necrophagians over the course of the story, which just makes them cooler. And, you know, that that's why The Fifth Sorceress, as awful as it is, is not the worst thing I've ever read. There's a few things in here that kind of work. Now, why nobody other than the Sorceresses thought to make a deal when they ran into the necrophagians, I'm not sure. Like, you'd think some fisherman would run into them and just be like, oh, uh, well, if you let me go, I'll come back with even more people, and then just left and never come back. Like, it seems strange, but whatever. And finally, 
on page 294, the coronation begins. And this is the climax of the first act. It should have happened a long fucking time ago. Like, imagine if in Star Wars, Luke did not leave Tatooine until two hours into the film. That's what this feels like. So during the ceremony, they take the Paragon from the King, like I said, they all temporarily lose their power, and during this brief interlude, the minions attack. Like, they crash through the glass ceiling, they massacre the guards, they massacre the wizards, they massacre the, all the civilians that are nearby. Like, just it's a total one-sided slaughter. And Tristan lives because Wig just makes them briefly invisible so they can hide for a few minutes, and they survive the initial chaos. And the only reason Wig was prepared to do this was because the sorceress has warned them. So if they hadn't done this, then they likely would have been killed in that initial fight, or at the very least, captured. Although they're kind of captured right after. And Tristan comes out of hiding and tries to fight Kluge, and it's he gets stomped. Like, it's a total one-sided fight. Like, it's not even a contest. It's not difficult for Kluge in the slightest. Like, Tristan just loses right away. And I will admit... The first time I read this, I was shocked by how easy it was for the bad guys to win here. Like, they they just completely wiped the floor with the good guys here. Like, I was expecting this to be a battle, and then they, like, have to run off, and then, like, the rest of the book is about a war going on in Eutrasia. But, like, no, the minions immediately massacre everybody, and then right after this they go out and just conquer half the country with no trouble whatsoever. Like... It's laughably easy, and I'll admit that did catch me off guard the first time I read it. So, the minions are holding Tristan and a bunch of other people who survived the initial fighting hostage, and Frederick is killed during this, and Shilaha, because of the shock and the trauma, just, like, she goes into shock, she's catatonic, she's dissociating, whatever. Uh, she's just holding totally still, silent, not reacting to anything. Uh, which is fine, I guess, that does happen sometimes when something traumatic happens. And they reveal that Natasha is evil, and that they want to take Shilaha somewhere for nefarious purposes. We don't know exactly what. And we need reminders that the villains are evil, so they, like, mutilate bodies and stuff. You know, they cut off the heads of all the wizards, except for Wig, who is still alive. And then they string them all together on a rope and, like, hang them up and fly around with them. You know, stuff like that. Just, just that we need to know that they're evil. So Kluge forces Tristan to kill his father, King Nicholas, and he does it by just telling him, like, hey, look, I can torture your father to death in front of you and everyone else here, and it'll be very slow, or you can just behead him and he dies quickly. And Tristan doesn't want to do it, but eventually uh, his father convinces him, like, look, just, just do it, son. You, you need to be king now. You're going to have to take responsibility for this sort of thing. And he kills him, and it's, like, super sad, I guess. And then Kluge takes Tristan's mother and throws her to the minions, who proceed to have non-consensual party time with her and all of the other women there. It's tasteless and not described in a lot of detail, but again, just very tasteless. And Wig just grabs an object and they use it to teleport him and Tristan to the catacombs below the palace so they're safe and they're hidden away. And they never use this teleportation again throughout the series. And they hide out there for a few days, and then Tristan swears revenge, and he swears to, that he's going to go save his sister, because uh, the minions go around and just cause as much destruction and chaos as they can in Eutrasia while they're there. You know, they kill as many people as they can, burn crops, destroy livestock in just a, a huge area, and there's basically no one to stop them. And then they uh, immediately go back to Parthalon along with Shilaha, and this is where the real story begins, and it's over 300 pages in. Now, the thing about this is that while Kluge is, like, just pure evil for no reason, you know, he has zero depth, he's just evil for fun, and he doesn't even have, like, a bombastic personality or anything, so he's not fun to be around, he's just boring to watch, Tristan and the others do have very real reason to hate him. So it motivates the heroes, if nothing else, to go on their journey. Like, you know, he killed Tristan's father, killed his mother, killed his friends, and kidnapped his sister. Like, he, he has very real reason to go off on this quest and to want this guy dead. So, on that level, he does work a little bit as a villain. Like, he's better than the sorceresses, at least, because, like, none of them really do anything to harm the heroes personally. Except for Natasha, but we'll get to her uh, in a little bit. And then Suck Hugh, off. 
but that doesn't happen until like very close to the end of the story so it doesn't really motivate them on their journey so it just it doesn't work and we spend dozens of pages with Wig and Tristan just deciding what they're going to do and I'm just gonna read you this next bit so to give you an idea of how long it takes to do anything in this book a man can only wade into any river once, the old one said, because the river is always moving, and therefore each time he approaches it, the river is different, as is the man. Thus a man can never wade into the same river twice, because change is a constancy of nature. To embrace change is effortless, but to resist it is impossible, and goes against the natural order of the universe. Now, that is a real saying. Like, the saying is, uh, a man can never cross the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. So normally, it is one sentence and they stretch it out to be an entire paragraph. Like, everything is just obnoxiously verbose. That should give you an idea of how long it takes anything to happen in this godforsaken book. So they gather up some supplies and then they leave to go off on their journey. And I should note that the first couple of times they mention money in this series, they call it Kasi, and then later it becomes Kisa. And it's not like it just happens once, so you think, okay, it's a typo, which is a shitty job editing, but it happens a couple of times as Kasi, and then it's just Kisa for the rest of the series, so I guess the author, like, changed his mind, but again, that's still a problem with the editing. Like, Jesus. Ba bad editing is not a good sign for professional writers, but for a first-time author, it is the kiss of death. Like, your, your book will not be good if it's not properly edited. I also want to note that Tristan has Kluge's sword still. Uh, it's called a dragon, and basically it's a regular sword, but it has an extra foot of blade hidden within the blade, so if you push a button, it'll pop out and pop back in. And it apparently has enough force that it'll go through someone's head if you push the button. So I think this is kind of a cool idea, uh, but they specifically mentioned a bunch of times that dragons are curved, and so that wouldn't really work. You couldn't really have it in there. Like, if you tried it, it would come out like this. It wouldn't come out straight, but okay. So while they're on their journey, they see that the entire country instantly fell into chaos. Like, there's murder, there's bandits, etc. You know, and that, that makes some sense. Like, the minions did destroy and kill as much as possible before leaving. But at the same time, like, there was no other authority after the king and his guards were killed. Like, there were no nobles town guards, mayors, there, there's no church of any sort that could help restore order that would have any sort of authority. Like, none? Okay. And then they're crossing a bridge and a mysterious creature appears. I am a Wiktor, it said venomously, yet also somehow casually. The creature's speech was perfect, almost eloquent, belying the horrific nature of its appearance. It pointed one of the talons at the prince. And you shall not find me such easy prey as those ignorant bloodstalkers or screaming harpies. I take great pleasure in what I do, and I am an expert craftsman. I am one of those whom the mistresses call upon when the task is to be very specific. And you must have great importance for them to, to them for one such as I to have been called forth and brought here to a foreign land. So he just can't stop monologuing. You know, the, the first thing that happens when he arrives is to introduce himself as a Wiktor and then explain what a Wiktor is. Like, it... I guess that's just how people talk in this world. Anyways, they kill it, and then they continue on their journey. And there's days of traveling afterwards, and then they reach an inn, and they stay the night. And they find a woman there who works as, like, a waitress, and she's being abused by everyone. And it, it's implied at first to be sexual, but they mention afterwards that uh, she hasn't been sexually abused yet. Uh, her name is Lilith. Uh, she says she was kidnapped and forced to work there because... The innkeeper, apparently, just right after there was no law around, decided that slavery was cool with him. So that's, that's just a thing he does. And Tristan decides to save her, and Wig discourages him from doing that, because he's like, hey, you, you can't help everyone. If you do that, it might cause trouble and get you killed. We need to go on this journey so that we can uh, defeat the sorceresses, and then that will save everyone. But Tristan just can't bring himself to abandon her because she gives him a boner. And, like, I kind of like this character trait where, like, he knows that he has to save the whole world, and he knows that it would be smarter to sacrifice a couple of people along the way to save the many, but he just can't bring himself to ignore the human cost of his actions, and so he goes off and does stupid things like this and saves people, but 
it still makes him look stupid because he really has no reason other than, yeah, she's hot. And also, like, it describes her again as the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. Like, it, it, it literally says that. that. This is the second time it's happened in a book where he's met a woman and described her as the most beautiful he's ever seen, and it's not the last time it happens either. So they take Lilith with them on the road, and she travels with them for a few days, and then a few nights later, she lures him to a pond away from Wig, and they start having funky time in the water. And I, I have to be careful with this so as not to get demonetized, but also because it might drive me insane if I voice it all out loud. Um, before finishing, Lilith reveals that she's actually Natasha, like she just magically altered her appearance, and she also binds Tristan with magic so that he can't move, and then continues onward while specifically mentioning that she's going to kill him afterwards and that he's going to get her pregnant and then she can have a really magically powerful baby. Christ almighty, Robert Newcomb. Like, at least pretend you weren't typing this up with one hand. It's a very hard erection. <laughs> yeah. It actually arouses me very much. Thank you. I'm not kink shaming you, but chill, okay? Like, again, Wheel of Time has a lot of scenes which have stuff like p characters getting tied up or characters getting spanked or something like that, but it's subtle, you know? It doesn't really detract from the story. I'm pretty sure Robert Jordan was a kink lord, he just wasn't this obvious about it. And anyways, Wig comes in and kills her before the end, and they, they say that apparently it doesn't count as sexual assault if Tristan didn't finish. That That's actually disgusting, and I'm moving on now. It's also really dumb for Natasha to just reveal who she was before the end. Like, if she had just waited another minute, then she could have just killed Tristan, been done with it, and then run off. Like, this... I don't know, this scene is gross, okay? It's gross, it's dumb, it makes me cringe, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. So, next up, uh, we go to Shilaha who is being tortured and brainwashed. And this takes several chapters, like the sorceresses give her nightmares they're, while they're also being nice to her during the daytime. And eventually she believes that they're her friends and she decides to be evil and she's forgotten most of her old life. And the reason they went over to get her is because they wanted her as their fifth member because five sorceresses is a full circle. And they couldn't do this with Natasha because Natasha's mother had no magic, so even though she's a powerful sorceress, she was she was weaker, and it just wouldn't have been good because shut up, the author says so. This part is okay, I admit. Like we we do get into Shyla's head quite a bit as her reality crumbles around her and then gets rebuilt. Like it, it takes too long, but it it's okay. I, I don't hate this section of the book. And then we get a chapter about Geldin, who remember was the dwarf servant of Sukhu off. And as her favored servant, uh, he has more freedom than most other slaves do. So he goes to the ghetto of the Shund, he gives out some food to the people there who might need it, and he sends a pigeon message across the ocean to Eutrasia to someone named Fagin. And this is when I started to like Geldin as a character. Like, he's been biding his time for literal centuries to get revenge on Sukhu off and the other sorceresses. And at the same time, he isn't callous to the suffering of other people. Like, he, it would be easy to write this character as, okay, he doesn't care about anyone or anything else, he just wants revenge because he hates Suck You off that much. But no, he's still trying to help people along the way, and he's doing this for his personal satisfaction, but also just because it would make the world better. And yeah, I, I just, I like that. You know, Geldin becomes a better character at this point. So Tristan and Wig reach the their destination, which is called the, the Shadowwood, and they are there to find Fagin, who we just learned Geldin was communicating with, and Fagin is like a powerful wizard who's been hiding for centuries, and he might help them. And the Shadowwood, no one ever goes in there, and no one ever comes out, because, like, the entrance to the woods, it, it's surrounded by a canyon, which if you fall in, you will die, but it's enchanted, so there's an illusion, and it looks like a forest which seems like a shitty thing to do, because someone could just wander by and fall in and die. 
couldn't you just do the opposite where it's a forest but it looks like a canyon so no one would go walking into it like you you would keep them away without killing anybody that seems like a nicer thing to do but okay and they, anyways they go across a bridge it's guarded by a gnome who is named shannon the small which is dumb because all gnomes are small but whatever and tristan being the beacon of morality he is holds shannon over the edge of the canyon and threatens to drop him if he doesn't guide them into the shadow wood and show them where fagin is and eventually shannon agrees to do that and they have a grand old time of it and tristan decides to be racist we had better get back there before he drinks all the rest of that stuff and becomes drunk again tristan said still laughing we truly do not need a guide who is both obstinate and inebriated the afterlife only knows he'll probably steal the horses too yeah that that's not the only time they mention that the gnomes are just alcoholic thieves Geez, dude. They're a fictional race. You can write whatever you want about them. Robert, why, why did you have to make them like that? They fight some giant spiders in the woods because we need an action scene. And then they meet Fagin. And Fagin is confined to a wheelchair because many centuries ago the sorceresses tortured him and his legs just never healed properly. And he's actually more powerful than Wig, we find out. But, I mean, that doesn't affect the story all that much. It's just he knows even more about magic than Wig does. Uh, he's also Natasha's father, which is not relevant, but it it's a thing that I should say. And he's impressed because Tristan is the chosen one. And we've heard about this plenty already, like Tristan is the chosen one. We just don't know what the chosen one is supposed to do. He's important to the prophecy, but we don't know what he's supposed to do as a result of the prophecy. He just, yeah, he's the chosen one. Like the whole point of a prophecy is that it says someone is going to do something. Like, they might save the world, or uh, unite all of England, or something, but Tristan, he's just, he's the chosen one. We don't know what the chosen one does, but he's the chosen one. They have a long conversation, where we learn that Fagin is communicating with Geldon via Pigeon, which we already knew, but Tristan and Wig didn't, and then they know the situation in Partholon. It seems like Fagin could maybe have warned people in Eutrasia about this, but whatever. Uh, and we also learn that Fagin can open a portal, which will... They can just walk through and be in Partholon because the plot needs it to happen. Like, just, yeah, apparently magic can open portals now. And, I don't know, at least they use this later. It's not just discarded. So they go, and because they can't communicate very easily, Fagin will just open the portal at noon every day and wait for them for a bit so that they'll have a chance to get back. And so they go through, and there's an obligatory moment with Geldon and one of his friends where they're, like, holding them at knife point going, Can we trust you? And they eventually uh, agree to work together. And then Geldon gives them leper cloaks so that no one will look too closely at them. And then he leads them out of the ghetto. And in order to get out, they have to uh, swim into a broken grate in, and uh, out the moat, basically. Which is very unpleasant because that's where all the sewage goes. And while swimming, Tristan, his sword gets stuck and he nearly drowns which makes him look stupid, quite frankly. Like, it, it needed to happen so that he could fall unconscious and then Geldon could drag him out and save his life. And then they realize, okay, we can trust this guy. Which, I, get, I guess that's fine, but a better way to handle it would have been, like, to either cut that out entirely or to have Tristan, like, fight some guards or something and nearly die and Geldon saves him them. Like, it, it would at least make him look less dumb. We still have 200 pages left, guys. So they're on their way to the sorceress home base, which is referred to as the Recluse, and they find a field where the minions execute people in a very unpleasant way. Basically, they tie them to wagon wheels, and like the wind kind of blows the wheels around, and when it turns, it cuts them and uh, twists their limbs in very unpleasant ways. Uh, like the sun out there burns them really badly. They don't get any food or water, so they slowly die of thirst. The birds attack, etc. It's a very unpleasant way to die. And they see a couple people tied to him who are clearly already dead. And they see one woman there who is still alive. And she has white feathered wings. And Tristan decides he wants to save her because she's naked and she makes his hose jump. So he kills some of the guards and then he unties her. And uh, we learn that her name is Nerissa. And Tristan describes her as the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. Like it just... I'm not paraphrasing. It, it just... It literally says that, and 
and it's not the last time it happens. It's the last time it happens in this book, but it's not the last time Tristan does this. When will this end? So Nerissa is what's called a Gallipoli, which is kind of an odd name because that's one letter off from Gallipoli, but whatever. And basically just sometimes minions are born who instead of having the leathery bat wings, they have white feathered angel wings. And the minions view them as abominations and they hate them. And so Tristan's like, okay, I guess we'll take Nerissa with us. And they take her with them for a while and then they leave her at a safe cabin which is hidden in the woods that Gelden showed them. And she decides that she loves Tristan after a couple of hours with him because main character. Gelden sneaks them into the sorceress's recluse by pretending that they are slaves and that he's bringing them to the stables. And then they like walk through it and gawk at some stuff that they see for a minute and then they are immediately found out and captured. What, what was even the point of that? Like they could have just been captured the instant they arrived in Partholon if this was how it was gonna go. Or hell, even way back at the palace during the initial attack. Like it would have saved time and it wouldn't really have changed anything. You know, I get that the story is more about the journey than the destination, but this journey is so stretched out and painful I would rather shove broken glass up my nose. So Tristan awakens in a cage, and the sorceresses are standing over him gloating. And several very, very long monologues later, we learn that their plan is to summon the Vigor and Vagary orbs, and then combine them, and they think that'll make them super mega powerful, and then they will use that power to kill everyone on the planet, except for the five sorceresses and Tristan, and they just like they needed a whole circle to do that. That's why they had to kidnap Shilaha and they couldn't just use Natasha. And then after they've killed everybody else, they want to repopulate the world with their inbred, magically gifted babies. What? <laughs> I'm going to repeat that. The villain's plan in this book is to kill everyone in the world except for the main character and the five villains, and then repopulate the earth with their inbred, magically gifted babies. And, like, it specifically mentions that they spent time developing a spell to counteract the negative effects of inbreeding. Like, w you had 300 years. Was there not a better use of your time? Th this is... Whatever, man. I guess villain plans don't need to make sense when they're just pure evil, pure insane. Like, who cares about things like motivations or just making sense in general? So Wig thinks that if they combine the orbs, they will destroy the world, and he tells Tristan, he's like, hey, we, we need to stop them or everyone will die. N not just most of them, everyone will die. And um, Tristan sees Shilaha, who has been brainwashed, and like I said, she's bisexual now, which means she's evil, and she also tries to grab Tristan by the crotch because sexual depravity, because she's evil, and suck you off, uh, ties up Tristan with magic, and then she proceeds to have a horny rendezvous with him when he doesn't want her to. And this time he does finish, and she immediately confirms that she's already pregnant. Never been more aroused in my life. I had to know this, and now so do you. Like, it's, it's a, not a tasteful scene. It's described in explicit detail, and it, it's, it's, not, it's not good. I want to move on. It, it is an awful scene but it is followed by a kind of good one. Like, I'm, I'm not even joking. Like, Tristan is, you know, in his cage away from Gelden and Wig, and he feels horrible, and tr he's traumatized, and Gelden actually spends some time uh, comforting him. Like, he basically tells him, look man, suck you off, has been torturing me for centuries. Like, she's made me impotent, she's made me a pet, like, I barely have a will of my own, but... I'm alive, and as long as you're alive, there's hope, and we can keep going. And, like, it's it, it's a decent scene. It really is. Like, I mean, Gelden is, and Wig are the only decent characters in this whole thing. They're not great, but they're decent characters, and scenes like that are why. It's like, there's little glimpses where it's clear, like, okay, Robert Newcomb kind of knew what he was doing. Or, well, <laughs> I shouldn't even say that much. Like, he accidentally knew what he was doing for one scene. So, suck you off comes back later, and she apparently magically sped up her pregnancy, so she's already almost ready to give birth after, like, a day. And is it just me, or does that sound horribly painful? Like, you know, pregnancy's already unpleasant to begin with, but, like, if, if it's growing that fast, I feel like you would feel your organs getting moved around and your skin and muscles stretching out and everything. I feel... 
that just sounds really unpleasant to me. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm the only one. But, uh, so the ceremony begins, and they do it in the room with Tristan and Wig, because, I, I don't know. Uh, and when they pull the stone out of the water, it, uh, should lose its power, Tristan thinks. And Tristan realizes that the magic light, uh, that they are summoning and is hitting it, is sustaining the stone. Or rather, his magic blood just kind of tells him this. And he also realized that the knowledge was no longer coming from his mind, but from the endowed blood that now so quickly coursed through his veins. And then there's an entire page of his blood, like, speaking to him, which I'm not reading. Like, it's, it's not that interesting, and it's not that important. Like, the point is, you could have had Tristan figure out this one thing alone. Like, you know, you could have had him figure out just this one little thing and realize, oh, okay, I'm the hero, I can do one thing right, and then I can use it to save the day. But like, no, he just gets that handed to him magically. Like, I don't like the term deus ex machina because it's so too much of a cliche, but that that's what this is. And he finally decides to try using the magic that he apparently has. And so he uses telekinesis to pull the paragon and it, it just comes out of the light and then all of its power is immediately gone. And the sorceresses really should have restricted him somehow from using magic, but they're just, they're dumb, I guess. Uh, when they lose the power, the spell just immediately collapses. There's a big explosion. It sends shards of rocks and hits all the sorceresses, uh, except for Shilaha. And it looks like suck you off, is uh, dead at first, but she pretty quickly turns out to still be alive. So just, th that's it. That's, that's how the sorceresses are beaten. That's how the villains of the story die. Like, it was just that easy. Like, I mean, I, I'm glad that Tristan doesn't just power through obstacles and he has to think a little bit in order to save the day, but it's just too quick and too easy. Like, we don't have time to really enjoy the climax and it's just, oh, okay, it's, it's done. Like, I mean, I, I mentioned Star Wars earlier, but like, imagine if that scene with the Death Star lasted 10 seconds. Like, it wouldn't be nearly as iconic as it is nowadays. So we learn that Faley, the leader of the sorceresses, uh, was once Wig's wife hundreds of years ago, and he's kind of sad about her death, and that doesn't really lead anywhere, but it's, it's, I mean, it's worth mentioning, I suppose. And then some more Wick tours appear, and Wig grabs the Paragon, and I, I guess it just, it has power back now. It, it just, it's, it's no longer a useless stone, like they don't have to dip it in the waters of the cave. It's just, it has its power back, and he uses it to make massive bursts of fire, which kill all the Wictors, which is eh, kind of cool, I guess. And then, because the magic is gone, the recluse starts to crumble, and it's about to fall in on itself. And Suckyu, off, has fled to the roof, and Tristan follows her up there. And they have a brief conversation, well, who am I kidding? Brief by this book's standards, it still lasts several pages, where he tries to convince her to come with them so that she can give birth, and then... Apparently when this happened, she just lost her powers, and I guess it's permanent, and she doesn't want to live that way, and she also thinks that she'll be taken prisoner forever, so she just commits suicide by jumping off the roof, and afterwards, when Tristan escapes the collapsing recluse, he goes back and cuts the dead fetus out of her and buries both of them. There's a joke about abortion in there, I'm not gonna make it. So they go back to the ghetto so they can just hop in the portal and go home, but Kluge and the minions are already there waiting, and they already know that the sorceresses are dead, so Kluge just decides, like, okay, I guess I'm in charge now, you know? I lead the army, so I'm, I'm in charge now. And they have captured Nerissa, and they found the portal, and he mentions, like, I'm gonna go over to Eutrasia, and I'm gonna conquer there next. And he says, In more evil stuff, and he'll, he'll make Shyla his wife, you know, just mwahaha. He is evil, and we need reminders that he is pure evil. And Tristan challenges him to a duel, and Kluge accepts because he wants revenge on Tristan because Tristan killed Sukyu off, and remember he was in love with her. And he also doesn't want to look weak in front of his soldiers, so he just, like, accepts his challenge. And, uh, they fight for a little bit, and before Tristan, like, just got his shit immediately rocked by Kluge, but now he can fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with him a little bit for a while. Like, he hasn't done any training or gotten any magical power-ups or anything, he just is better. He's able to fight Kluge now. And for a minute it looks like he'll lose, but then he does the same trick that Frederick did at the beginning, where he looks over his shoulder and he's like, look behind you! And then Kluge 
like a fucking dumbass, looks over, and then Tristan throws his knife at him and wounds him, and that that's it. That's how he wins. Like, uh, he's wounded, and then Tristan cuts his head off. There, there are two climaxes in this book, and they both suck. Like, the second one's a little better, because, like I've said before, Tristan and Kluge have an actual rivalry. Tristan has reason to hate him. So, like, there's build-up. And it's not over too quickly. It's just dumb. It's really, really dumb. And plus, during the fight, Kluge throws a weapon of his own, and it hits Nerissa, and she's wounded, and she dies a couple minutes later. And it's so sad that Tristan's girlfriend of three days is gone. It, it's so sad. And so, among the minions, uh, if you kill the leader, you become their new leader. And this was brought up earlier, like uh, when they first introduced Kluge, they mentioned that he became the leader by killing the last guy. And it, so it's not out of nowhere, but like just now Tristan is in charge and he, uh, and he orders them all to like free all their women that are in the brothels and to start taking wives and to stop sexually abusing people and to just stop killing people in Parthalon and just, you know, all this stuff that they've been doing for hundreds of years. He's just telling them to stop. And then they just agree with no coercion because he's the main character. And then they just go back to the portal and they go home. And then we go to the epilogue, which is really short, mercifully so. And just some spiritual presence that we know nothing about appears at the grave of Tristan and Sukhu, Off's child's grave. And he named his son Nicholas, by the way. And this spiritual presence, like, grabs the child's body, brings it back to life, which apparently that's a thing that can be done. And it just takes him up into the sky, and that's the end. It, 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 what the fuck? <laughs> Like, the first time I read that, I was like, what the goddamn fuck just happened? Like, the, the, like she commits suicide, and then he cuts the dead baby out of her and buries it, and then it comes back to life, and some evil presence takes it. Like, uh, that's just, that, that's, that, that's a thing. That's how this book ends. I'm losing my mind. So I hope everything makes sense now. Uh, I've called this the worst epic fantasy I've ever read, and that's for good reason. I seriously doubt there's anything out there that is genuinely just worse than this. Like, the plot is stretched out and slow as fuck, except for a few points where it just goes way too fast. Like, you know, the first climax with the sorceresses where they're all just dead right away. Uh, Tristan, the protagonist of the story, is an obnoxious man-child who has a low IQ normally and a negative IQ when his dick is hard. But he's also the chosen one who's here to... do something. And he has crazy magic that he uses exactly once in the story and never has to train with or anything. The villains are all just cackling madmen, which could be kind of fun some of the time, but the hyper-violence and the, all this sexual assault make it impossible to get into that mindset. Like, it just makes this story too dark and too serious, so I can't really just laugh at how over-the-top they are except for a few brief moments. Like, none of the characters here have any depth whatsoever. Like, they all just act out their most obvious emotions that are all on the most surface level possible. Like, you, you already know everything about them. They're boring. Like, there, there's not even really a way for me to talk about them much because you, having watched this video, already know everything about them. There, there's no depth. There's no subtext. There's nothing to even go into. Like, the only characters that I thought were kind of good were Wig and Gelden. Like, they're both still two-dimensional, don't get me wrong, like, there's, there's nothing to them. They both just, again, act out emotions just in your face. There's no subtlety about it. But they are at least both likable while they're doing that. There's nothing here resembling themes, even though it seems to be trying for them. Like, maybe it's trying to do a sort of Wheel of Time dichotomy between men and women, or between different types of magic, but, like, it's just... It's too vague to actually say anything. You know, it doesn't go into any real detail. It's just like, yep, this is good, this is evil, don't mix them or bad things happen. And like, yep, men can be trusted with magic. Sometimes there are some evil men who use magic, but women are just evil naturally and that's why we can't trust them and they can't uh, be trained in it. Which really is even stupider when you remember that there are men like Kluge who do not use magic at all and they still do such disgusting violence. Like, clearly you don't need magic to be evil, but, like, it, it just makes women evil. That's just a thing. 
Like, Wheel of Time got weird sometimes with some of its gender essentialist ideas, but at least it had ideas, and at least it was commenting on the real world. And beyond that, the closest we get to anything resembling themes is like some half-assed fantasy wisdom and half-assed fantasy proverbs, which sound more profound than they really are. And the story, it's a mess. I think you can tell that by now. Like, there's nothing but monologues and a couple of action scenes, and again, just like with the characters, it's all totally surface level. There's no interpretation to be had. Like, j just try to imagine for a moment fans reading this and then trying to form theories about it. You know, trying to discuss it with each other or thinking themselves, like, what'll happen next? What's the true nature of this world that we're not understanding? Like, you, you can't imagine them doing that because there's nothing to build off of here. Like, th there's nothing. There, there's no depth to any of this. That It's hard to even criticize a lot of the time for that exact reason. I will say that this works okay as a standalone, uh, like, at, at, least, at least as long as you ignore the epilogue. Like, there's not a huge cliffhanger or anything. That, that's kind of nice. You know, it's just uh, some evil dudes attacked the prince, killed a bunch of his friends, kidnapped his sister, and then he rescues his sister, kills the bad guys, and then goes home. Like, okay, that, that works as a standalone story, but again, Nicholas is apparently brought back to life and something nefarious is going on there, so we know it's going to continue. And just don't even get me started on the extreme misogyny and homophobia. Like, I pointed out that women who have magic are just kind of evil just because they're naturally attracted to the vagaries, and the vagaries are evil magic, but... Once you give in to the evil magic, it also makes you a bisexual raping sadist. And it's like, it, again, if I have to explain to you why this is bad, I'm probably not going to change your mind, because it's just, like, I'm not even reading into this. Like, it's not subtext or anything, it's just straight up said. And, like, you can't even say it's a product of its time or anything, because it's only 20 years old. It came out in, like, 2002 or 2003, like... Jeez, man, chill. Like, Newcomb clearly just is not skilled enough to even write subtext. Like, if he was trying to make all of this subtextual, he failed. He failed completely. Like, the only real positive here are that there are some parts of the story that are so crazy or so bad that they become hilarious. Like, like I said before, the villain's evil plan is just inbreeding to populate the whole earth, or the Wiktor literally just introducing itself by saying, Hi, I'm a Wiktor. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm about. Uh, the over-the-top nature of the villains is sometimes entertaining enough that I was able to get through this entire book twice. And it's, again, it's, it's not short. <laughs> it's a long book. And uh, that's about all I have to say for now. I uh, will be back with the rest of the trilogy soon. I could maybe have fit this all into one really long video, but like I said earlier, that would be bad for the pacing. Like, this is a good place to stop, let it sink in, uh, think about it some more, and then I can go do the second and third books together. Like, if I didn't have the pacing right, it would make things stretched out, even if it's the same length. And, uh, I'll see you soon with books two and three. It might be, like, a week from now, it might be a month from now, I don't know, but it'll, it'll be soon, and I'll, I'll just tell you right now. Books two and three get worse. Goodbye. Special, special, special thanks to everyone who watched, including all the patrons whose names are here, and the $10 and up of above the $10 patrons are uh, Apo Savalainen, Olivia Ray, and Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Great Grebo, Carcat Kitsune, L. Lindbergh, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Matthew Baudreau, Microphone, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, They Victus, and Wesley. Thanks to all of them. I couldn't do it without them. Well, maybe I could, but it would it would be much less fun, much worse to, to do. Uh, and thanks to everyone who watched. If you want your name on here, consider donating. If you don't feel like doing that, then, you know, just rate the video, comment, subscribe, share it around, uh, annoy all your friends with the spam. Uh, goodbye.